I'm here today with my friend and colleague, Deborah Boyer. And she and I are going to have a conversation on consciousness. I'm excited to have this conversation. Deborah, how would you like to begin? Well, I first want to appreciate you for um, gathering content for this consciousness summit from so many of our teachers. And I appreciate you re-inviting me to contribute something. And I, I hope this can be of benefit. I've thought a lot of like what helped me personally and what I've seen helped my students. So this is one lens, you know, from my background and what has worked for me. And I hope it's helpful to others. But well, let me ask you a question then. So how long have you been a Trillian teacher? Um, been like 20 years. Ooh. Okay. Or maybe a little more than that. Okay, I first thank you. to waking down in 1998. And then I I guess our whatever whenever the first mentor training I, I really don't even remember the year, but it was a long time ago. Right. I knew he'd been a teacher for longer than I, but I wasn't really kind of having the context. And I just like the idea that this is things you've gleaned from twenty years of experience. Yeah. Oh, thank you. So I interrupted you. What else what else did you want to say? Well, I like that interruption. And what I notice about you is that I feel, you know, the, your presence, the presence of what we might call consciousness as you speak. And that's very helpful to me because it helps um, kind of settle me, which leads to the topic of, I think, what was challenging for me on my path was working with my own states of dysregulation, you know, emotionally and physically that prevented um, my attention and energy from being able to rest into myself as what we might label consciousness. Um, you know, if we're trying to give language to something that's really ineffable, but um, I found that that was a challenge that was obstructing my path, this sense of autonomic nervous system dysregulation and emotional instability. And a lot of that um, was helped by the very warm, empathic reception <laughs> that I found in our community of teachers and students. Mm -hmm. There's just so much um, acceptance of the human condition and situations we go through. And I was quite divided against myself, always feeling like I had to um, conform myself into some better version, you know, in order to be, to be ready. So for what would be called awakening. And that view is, is actually um, legitimate in other paths. And I had been influenced strongly by that view. And um, I continue to believe in evolution and <laughs> maturation and integration. And I see the, our awakening that we offer here as such a strong foundation for that to occur rather than having to get all ready um, beforehand. Yeah, thank you for that, yeah. actually bringing this up because I think this is something a lot of people will be able to relate to, this idea of having a nervous system that's not regulated or has a hard time finding regulation. And then if there's a belief that that has to be found before you can really even almost continue on a path like this, um, but like you were saying, that sort of the, the welcoming that you found in the community and by, by teachers let you start to relax into understanding that you too could awaken. But I, I love that you gave some really concrete example in your own life. 
that I think many people can relate to. I know I can relate to that idea mm. of getting easily dysregulated. Mm. It's something I can completely relate to. So thank you. Yeah. yeah. And I, I just see this a lot with people who are like um, struggling, you know, and the, the struggle itself has this effect or it's an expression of the the dysregulation and there's like a sense that with or a hope that with the awakening the dysregulation would end and unfortunately that's not the case either there's more more room and more resource to work with it it's more pliable but it's definitely not gone yes i can relate totally <laughs> <laughs> yeah and um, I think another thing that's hard for people is this sense of maybe um, like competition or status seeking or like, you know, well, she had her awakening. Why can't I? And when's it going to happen? And this is just, um, I think it's very, very natural, very human and also very painful and um, just kind of the an orientation that I I wish um, there could be some help in relieving people of that. Although it is kind of inevitable when we're in a community that's talking about and tracking and measuring or assessing awakenings. There's that natural. Well, here's a metric that I need to, or I want to check off. Exactly. You know, it was coming to me when you said that it's, it's very likely that we can't prevent those kind of comparisons and mm -hmm. longings, but we could normalize them as being okay. Yeah, thank you. Normalizing. So we don't have to feel bad, for, that like a bad person because I'm comparing myself to others. Right. Typically, what the problem is when we compare ourselves, like, I don't have what they have, that kind exactly. of comparison. Exactly. Just to normalize it, it's part of the human condition. Yeah. yeah. Very much so. Another thing I found that really helped me was just, um, like, brief moments of inquiry rather than extended, longer meditations or even contemplations, like um, many teachers have these wonderful guided um, invitations where you really get to explore the layers of mind. And sometimes those were helpful, and sometimes I would just end up feeling like more of a failure because so there was so much chaos and noise in the background that it was hard to stay on track. So I think, you know, in situations like that, to know that it's okay just in this moment, you know, um, what is here and um, just sensing into that, the depth of identity, you know, at the bottom of it all. Um, so I've done that. That present, just present moment, simple, Checking in, is that how you would say, just like, what is here in this present moment? Yeah, yeah. And um, kind of exploring attention, like so my attention is kind of like an arrow, you know, going out. Well, what's at the, the root or the origin of that arrow? Oh, and, thank you. Yeah. Yes, so that's where they, that's those who are like, it sounds like little short excursion into inquiry along the lines of what you just suggested is what you needed. Yeah, yeah. And I also like, um, I wish we said, you know, consciousness ing, like consciousness as a verb rather than a static state. Because it is a um, an ongoing activity, 
rather than some, uh, yeah, I can tell you understand what I'm saying, and I'd love to hear how you would language that yourself. Well, it's not something that I, I've really given a lot of thought to, but I, I do like this idea of consciousness as a verb, a kind of a process, a and I can think of it as being like almost by a moment by moment recognition. Um, whereas if we put it as a thing that we have to go outside of ourselves almost to find when it's actually right here all the time. Right. Yes. And that, that, that right really, now. yeah. Yeah, thank you. And that really fits with our sense of embodied awakening because the body is such a dynamic, living, constantly shifting process. Mm -hmm. And the awakening dimension of our nature is always there riding along okay. but like you said not some thing we go out to find yeah and just the transmission of being around others i think is so so helpful and that's just it's always been something we've encouraged and invited but i just find it soothing to know mm -hmm. that this transmission is doing its work underground like a plant that's growing even though you can't see it and you don't need to keep pulling it up to check you know how big is it now and yeah right mm -hmm. yeah so those are some of the things that i've just been musing about in the couple of weeks i've had between scheduling our call and meeting here today yeah thank you now, I, I was what I was hearing, but so that's why I want to find out if I'm if it's true. That was this often a solo journey from you. You said like the meditations that work for many people didn't work for you, and those are meditations that generally a teacher would lead. So when you did this work, was it more solo, or did you also have some assistance from your teachers? Well, I had assistance from my teachers in locating we'll use the shorthand term consciousness, in the midst of like emotional turmoil. That's what was really helpful to me. I had been a student of Adi Da and had studied, you know, his terminology with consciousness a lot. So I didn't really feel like I needed clarification there at the cognitive level. Mm -hmm. or, I don't know, it's not just cognitive, but what really helped me with teachers was meeting me where I was and helping me land there rather than a guided exploration. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Not to at all to diminish the value of that. It just, it wasn't um, a tool that I needed at that time. Thank you. I think this is really great to you know, also let people know that not every this we've always say it's not a cookie cutter process, but we don't. It's we need examples of how it's not a cookie cutter process, and so you're giving us a really good example. And thank you too, because you know a lot of this consciousness summit so far has been teachers leading exercises. So those people that those are suited for they will probably like want to listen to the next one and the next one. But at this moment, we, the, yours is at this point only the second that didn't include an exercise. And yet my experience is that they both included strong transmission. Thank you so much, CL. Yeah, totally. totally. We really appreciate this time to connect with you and explore oh. this rich topic. Thank you so much. Thank you. Anything more to say from your side? Mm. Blessings and peace. No. Great. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much for joining me. And I really have become enriched by this conversation. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you for the benefit you're bringing to mm. others by doing this. You're welcome. Mm.